Okay. So those who watched replay, at least they didn't see the tears. So I want to start with welcoming you all. It's so, so beautiful to be connected to all of you. And I really believe that over the last years and months, many of us have grown into a family, a community. Um, you know, we go, some of us go years back. And there are so many known faces. You know, I've never met you in real life, but I feel like I have so many, you know, your family among you. And that became really clear when I sent that email, I think it was late August or early September, when I said I had to take a break because of my health. The messages that poured in with your advice, with your prayers, with your guidance, with your well wishes, um, really touched me at the time. Took me a while to read them because of the brain fog I had, but it meant so much and it showed me also how much love is out there. And sometimes we forget how much love is out there even among strangers. And I just wanted to, to give that back and say thank you. Um, it made me deeply grateful. I also want to take this opportunity to thank my team. Couldn't have done this without them. Um, Frank, Pamela, Akosua, and all the rest of the team, Rwanda team and international team. I also want to take this opportunity to thank my family and friends, my children, um, because um, they may watch the replay. And again, I couldn't have done without all of you. So today I will be vulnerable. Well, <laughs> as you've seen already, um, I will be vulnerable because first of all, it's deeply feminine to be vulnerable. But second of all, it's deeply human. And I will tell my raw story today, <clears throat> my story of how I fell ill um, and how I was very close to death, facing my, my own mortality and how I self-healed. Still on the journey, I haven't fully recovered. I'm still housebound, seven months now. Remember the COVID lockdown? Well, it's been seven months for me now. Um, four months uh, trapped in my own body and a bedroom and now seven months housebound, but I'm doing very, very well. So this story, however, is not really about me. The story I want to tell today is about you. It is about you and your families and the members of your community. I will talk today about excess death across the globe, why these deaths are occurring in all age groups and why I can tell you a lot about the reasons and how to avoid them because I have almost been one of them. And I believe I can share insights that no doctor will be able to share with you. And that is why I thought it's so important to speak to all of you because you are gardens of your own lives and bodies, but you're also gardens of your families, your children, your you know, children, your relatives and your communities. And unless we have awareness, um, many more of us will face the risk. So I will also talk about other illnesses that are very closely related to all of that. The cancers, the heart disease, the diabetes, all of it. Because we have a new pandemic happening and so many people are unaware that it is happening, why it is happening, and also how it can affect any one of you, including the young ones. So if you have children or teenagers. Um, so what I will be sharing is not a typical health story. It is a health story that is unique 
because I've been trapped in my own body for four months. And I was trapped in one bedroom somewhere in London for four months, which means I had a unique position to self-observe what's happening in my body. Um, and again, those are the things I want to share with you today. Um, so I hope that you will all be tuned in, switch everything off. This is a life-saving soul, soul session. And in fact, I hope that after the session, if you found it worthwhile, you will share it widely because we're here to save lives in our communities. So before I get started, I want to quickly check with you. And what I want to check with you is, I want to ask you a few questions. First of all, I want to hear from you. Who among you suffers from cancer? Has a close family or relative suffering from cancer or know someone who died from cancer recently in the last maybe year or two? Can you type that in? You can, you can wave in and also type it into the, to the um, chat box. Just say me or yes or something like that. All right. Yes, me, me, yes. Just four months ago. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. I know. Last week. Yes, my wife. Yes, yes. Oh, my God. Look. He died in December. Yes, family member. My husband one year ago. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Yes, my sister. I know someone, my brother. Too. Can, you, can you recognize something? Just among us, just among us, so many are affected. Husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, friends, members of the community. All right, next. Who among you, yourself, suffers from insomnia? can't sleep, can't sleep many hours, wakes up in the middle of the night, has sleep apnea, who has um, insomnia problem? Me, 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 insomnia. These are all the guys from the US, huh? <laughs> you, you suffer from insomnia more than anyone else. Me, me, all right, me sometimes. Okay, so a hell of a lot, lot of you suffer from insomnia, sleep apnea, and so on. What about autoimmune diseases or diabetes too? Who among you has autoimmune diseases or diabetes too? Can we see? All right. Me, me, um, okay, recently diagnosed with autoimmune disease. I have anxiety attacks, sometimes my mother, me, me, me. You know, this is, it's crazy because we're about 300 people in the shop, in the, in the room and it's pouring in, right? Who suffers from regular headaches, migraines, any pains or blood pressure problems, high blood pressure and so on. All right, again, me, me, yes, me. All right, again, pouring in. The answers are pouring in. Okay, who among you just very concretely suffers from long COVID? And please put LC for long COVID. So we make sure this is for long COVID. Okay, LC, 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 LC. Oh gosh, all right. Okay, so quite a few of you in the room as well. And um, lastly, my last question is, who, is who among you is regularly on pharmaceuticals, medication for your blood pressure, your diabetes, your migraines, your insomnia, your depression, your anxiety, your cancers? Me, 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 me. All right. A couple of saying, no, not me, not diabetes, me, me, who isn't? Me, since, yeah, some give the dates. Okay, so look, this is why I'm saying the story we are talking about today is not my story. It's everyone's story. I just believe that I had 
being put in a unique position because it was so severe and so close to death. And, um, you know, I, I was able to self-absorb that I was able to, um, to see things that even I, someone who had considered myself pretty self-aware and health aware um, and very health conscious, that even I um, felt so sick and I had to learn new things. So one last question before I continue. Can you hear my earrings dangling again? This? Can you hear them? Then I'll take them off. Can you hear them? Are they disturbing you? No? Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. So um, I'm gonna do a combination between slides and just talking to you. The reason being also because um, the slides will help me to just remember. It's easy on my brain. Okay. So. I can see Haile and Sultan. Can you see? Can you see my slides? Okay, fantastic. All right. So let's start or continue rather our soul session. As I have pointed out to you, some of you may be very aware of it, and some may not. There are excess death happening globally. What explains these excess deaths? How do they occur? And above all, how can you protect yourself from those excess deaths happening to anyone among you or your families or loved ones? Um, again, I know because I was close as being, to being one of the statistics. These are data that you can look up in national statistics across the Western world. And what it means, excess death means that, you know, there's a death average every year for the last decades. And, you know, sometimes it's 10% more or 10% less in between that range. But we are seeing 30, 40% more excess death. Long COVID is responsible for thousands of US deaths, reports say, but true numbers are likely much higher. Yes, I believe long COVID is also part of that um, phenomenon that we're seeing more death, but it is not the only one. For those of you who do not know, millions suffer from long COVID. In the UK, almost 2 million millions are suffering from long COVID. The numbers are probably much higher. Uh, and long COVID basically are the long-term effects of COVID. So people who have been infected with um, the virus um, and as a result, sorry, and as a result of it, um, they are developing symptoms. Um, and many of them are unable to really work or be part of their societies and communities anymore. Um, many long COVID patients are also reporting suicidal thoughts. You can hear, see here articles, is long COVID linked to suicides? Scientists warn of a hidden crisis. Some 44% of long COVID sufferers said they had considerable, they had considered suicide. So the question is, um, you know, just let me go back quickly. Just wanna go back. Um, I want to tell you quickly, and let's go back on video, please. Um, I think I've lost some of you on video. Um, I want to just tell you quickly the start of my journey. And also for those of you who are unaware of long COVID, um, long COVID basically, again, are the after effects. Um, the problem with diagnosing it is because it can show up in so many symptoms. And you will see in a minute what it can look like, that it is very difficult for doctors to diagnose long COVID. 
So here quickly my journey. So you get a little bit of context before I dive, dive into the deep end of the story, the raw end. I was catching COVID myself in March, 2020, just after our Africa business food camp in New York City. So on the way home, you know, I already felt weak and I crashed um, at home. I had never felt so tired. I couldn't do anything in the house anymore. I couldn't get up, up the bed. I couldn't uh, cook or really take care of my kids. And that continued for three months. So it was my children who did the shopping. Luckily, we lived in Germany at the time. So the shops are around the corner. It's not like in the US. Um, my children had to do the, the shopping. My dad came up here and there to, to, to assist. Um, so this is how it started. I made improvements four months later and managed in August of the same year to move to Rwanda. Hardly anyone among, knew, among you knew that I was already sick. I moved to Rwanda and what really worked for me that entire year was the lockdowns. Because during the lockdowns, everything was kind of still. And that helped me to recover. Being in Rwanda also, the lockdown was extended much longer than in the West. It extended well into 2021. And again, um, that helped my recovery. I you know, did a lot of things in terms of meditation and, and uh, taking care of my, my food and all of that. Uh, but it was really taking it slowly. And month by month, I recovered from my long COVID. About a year after the pandemic, around April 2021, I remember I told my mom, mom, I think I'm almost healed. Maybe I'm like 70 or 80% there. I didn't know at the time it was long COVID, by the way, right? It was just, I told everyone, I'm aging. I don't have the energy I used to have. I'm operating at, you know, 50, 60, 70% of my usual self. And in April, 2021, I told my mom, mom, I'm, you know, I could walk again, make long walks. Um, I could meet people. I started, uh, we started on our business um, um, and so forth. So I was almost healed. Late August, 2021, a few months after um, the official rollout of the, the V, I'm gonna put it because I'm gonna put it on, um, I put it in the chat box um, because um, I'm going to share it in YouTube. So when I say the V, that's what I mean, all right? Um, because it would, you know, you, your YouTube videos can be removed as a result of that. So um, I'm sharing my experience. Um, by the way, I think this is very important. I'm sharing my experience. Um, and In late August 2021, a few months after the rollout, I decided um, to take it because um, I saw how our freedoms were cut down, including in Rwanda, you know, uh, in terms of where you can go and where you cannot go and what you can do and what you cannot do. Um, and um, so to make a longer short story short, um, it went downhill from there. Um, I had the first one in late August. And then um, because I was busy or not really well, I took um, the second one in November. And I really started to deteriorate in December. In December, however, also was also the finalizing of my house, um, which was more work then I would usually take on, on the moving um, and so on, um, meaning I didn't rest also as much as I usually did. And that combination brought me to May last year, where I again was so sick 
um, I had to cancel our live session, some of you may remember. And I ended up in hospital um, here in Kigali with extreme shortness, shortness of breath and, um, and uh, unable to speak. So they diagnosed bradycardia, which is my pump, my sorry, my heart is pumping too slowly. Uh, it was pumping, your heart pumps usually at 60 to 100. Mine was pumping between 40 and 45, all right? So 60 to 100 is normal, 40 to 45, and that's me standing, like uh, sitting and standing. That means like I'm not asleep, all right, or in bed. Um, I visited a lot of doctors in Rwanda, um, and I will be very open and raw today. I was um, diagnosed with all sorts of things, all right? So they said I had, you know, if they had to monitor me, so I was on, on um, how do you say, um, cables for a week. And they said, if this doesn't improve, I need a pacemaker, which is a major operation, right? Um, but they have to monitor. Um, I went to another doctor. She said, you're in one of menopause. Where did menopause come from? I went to another doctor and they said, um, you have very high cholesterol in your blood. Are you stressed? Not stressed at all. I'm resting more than I have rested my entire life. Um, so they said, we um, should suppress that. Uh, and I said, I don't want the suppressants. So um, actually it continues. I saw five, six doctors and they all diagnosed something else. Um, I went on holiday last summer, okay? The reason why I went is because I knew it was not the menopause. I knew that the menopause came out of nowhere. I knew it was not my heart. I knew it was not the high cholesterol I thought something's terribly wrong with me. Maybe I have cancer. And the reason why I went on a holiday feeling a bit stronger in July is because I thought, who knows how this is going? Let me take a holiday with my children before I'm too weak to go on a holiday with them. That's why I went. And not really knowing what's happening, I arrived in London and my friend told me before I did the Europe trip with my kids, by train, by the way, because of climate change, was a beautiful trip. My friend, who is a nutritionist, and who wrote her master studies on long COVID, said, I think you have long COVID. Everything speaks for it. She's been studying long COVID for two years. She did her master's on it. And I mean, what is the likelihood of that, right? And I looked it up, watched the YouTube videos, and it just, it was like 110% match. That's it. That's what I have. So I just watched a few videos um, and I said, okay, I need to inform myself. And one of the key videos I watched write that down if you have long COVID, is that long COVID sufferers um, have a disbalance of electrolytes. You call it ORS in the USA. And that is crucial because that video was one of the videos that saved my life. So now let's go back to the screen share. Right, Hila, can you see my screen? Thank you. Um, okay. All right. So the picture you see on the left, all right, with the long hair, that is me just a couple of months before the pandemic hit. That is how I looked. 
look at my lash, long, thick hair, healthy. The, the picture next to it is a few months bef before my, um, my breakdown, my total crash last year. And you can see that I lost almost all of my hair, all right? Not only did I lose a lot of it, but it also cut short. It looked like I have like an Afro or something, okay? But what really shocked me is when I crashed, I did not just lose my hair or my energy. I went from the young, vibrant woman to an 80 year old. Yes, you heard me right. An 80 year old in a couple of months. So when I say an 80 year old, um, my hair completely great here, but the hair is the least of the problems in all my bodily functions. I couldn't tie a, sh a shoelace anymore. I felt like an 80 year old close to death. So I want to show you a few of the symptoms um, that I experienced. And the reason why I want to show you them is because many of you will recognize yourself in those symptoms, or you will recognize relatives, family members, or even your children with those symptoms. And that's why it's important, okay? I will go in more detail on the first slide and then you quickly hover over the next. So chronic fatigue syndrome is very, very important for you to realize. It's not just a long COVID symptom, it's an autoimmune symptom. And a lot of women suffer from that, 75% of women, not just now, but even days back. When I was in Eritrea, I knew several of these women who had chronic fatigue syndrome, being energetic and doing things and then not being able to do things for a week or two weeks or months, just laying in bed. And that is a, a disease that, or an illness that is very often misdiagnosed. We call these women, they have maniac depression or they're just being difficult or you know they're depressed. No, it is a very serious condition chronic fatigue syndrome, and there are women who suffered among it, especially also in Africa, for 20, 30, 40 years, all right? Be aware of that, if that is your wife, your mother, okay? So I had that, and I was bed bound for three and a half months. Extreme brain fog I had. I'm telling you, eight-year-old women, inability to think, remember, listen, or make th sense of things. I, I couldn't remember names. Um, um, I couldn't remember names of things in the house, um, people I know. Um, Frank is in the room, one of our um, great team members. If he write, wrote me a WhatsApp and that exceeded more of than two lines, I don't know what he's saying. It overwhelms me. I don't know. I cannot make sense out of it. So I'm saying, Frank, one line and only if it's very, very urgent. Okay, so if something is urgent with, with the business, all right? Um, severe insomnia, um, for four weeks, I only slept 90 minutes a night. I couldn't sleep during the day. My brain was so inflamed, I was unable to sleep. There was no sleep ability in my brain anymore. Excessive deep stomach breathing, shortage of breath in my stomach, feeling of dying caused by electrolytes. Um, um, deficiency. Severe tinnitus in my ear, severe burning for three months in the entire body, especially in lungs and stomach, severe rheumatoid arthritis. I cannot tell you. The whole body was in pain. You know, when I started sleeping again after months, I woke up in the middle of the night because my leg was on the other leg. And the weight of my other leg was so heavy that I was in pain. Or, you know, if, if my hand is somewhere like this, I'm in pain, it, um, um, every bone hurts. Severe muscle weakness. I couldn't close a bottle. I couldn't hold anything in my hand. Um, vasculitis, um, which are inflamed blood vessels. My arteries were turning dark blue. I had mottled skin. I had red skin. I was looking sunburned. Um, loss and sensation of on skin of my on my right leg. So just very very 
briefly here what I want to say. Um, I collapsed going back to London from our train trip. And I collapsed in the train, in the international train, um, just shortly before the border of, uh, um, not Bavaria, sorry, Belgium. And I collapsed in the, in the, in the, um, in the train with excessive deep stomach breathing which is caused by electrolyte deficiency. I didn't know that at the time. I couldn't talk anymore. I felt I'm dying in the train. And what I'm telling you is, you, you can't see it, I'm, focused, I'm, I'm pointing on my stomach. The life energy is in your stomach. I felt it was sucking out life of me. I was literally holding on to my life energy. So the ambulance came into the train. I'm the last person who wants to create inconvenience for anyone, but I heard, you know, we have to stop the train. We have an emergency. I ended up in emergency in that hospital and none of the emergency doctors knew what to do with me. I'm pointing, are they, do you have breathing problems? I'm like, I'm pointing to my stomach and I'm just saying life energy because I cannot say more. And I hear the doctor saying, give her steroids. You know, as I said, I'm, I'm not really there anymore. I'm just holding on to life. But I hear the emergency doctor saying, give her steroids. And they're preparing. And I just have this, I, I felt I was so close to death in that moment that I felt they don't know what they're doing. They're going to push me over. And with the last energy I had, I was just doing this. And he's like, what's the matter? And I'm doing this because I cannot talk. I, I don't, you can't see me anymore. Like I'm waving, like, no, no, I'm waving. And he's like, what the mat what's the matter? And I'm like, no steroids. That's all I could, no steroids. And then I can hear him saying, well, you, you know, we need to stabilize you, you're in emergency, something like that. And, and my kids are in the room, they're leaving because they're scared seeing me like this. And, and I just kept on saying, like, no steroids. And I said, electrolytes. And they ended up giving me electrolytes. And four hours later, I was able, they wanted to keep me in, in the hospital, but we're there with our luggage and our kids. And I said, we're going. I need to make it to London and put myself into a hospital. So this is the first time where I would have almost died because you can die from electrolyte uh, uh, deficiency. The problem with that is when you collapse, the doctors are checking your pulse, they're checking your breathing, they're checking the oxygen levels and all of that. Electrolyte deficiency is not the first thing they check. That is, that YouTube video changed my, saved me, all right? Um, so that is very important what I wanna say. And the second collapse was in London, also at the emergency, all right? And with the same, um, with the same kind of uh, uh, symptoms, and again, they had no idea what to do. And I remember my friend was in the house because I stayed in her house and I just said, electrolytes. And she knew, she knew because I had told her a story in the train. So she put electrolytes in a bottle and gave me the bottle into the ambulance. And she put too much because she was so nervous, right? And again, I, I, don't, I wanna make a long story short. They did not know what to do with me. And I felt I'm dying, I'm, I'm holding on to breath. And with, again, the last strength, I zipped from that water and it was super salty. And that again was one part where I, uh, I, I, it saved my life. So I wanna put this out there because it's so crucial, okay? All right, so here we go. Just check yourself if you see some of your symptoms. I had all of them, 56, all right? myocarditis, 
um, skin psoriasis, very high blood pressure laying in bed, very low blood pressure, trachycardia, bradycardia, um, itchy skin, shivering, I mean, you name it, all right? The list goes on. Very blurred vision, I had hallucinations, anxiety. I thought when cars, especially the police cars, are um, moving by the house, I thought they're crashing into my bedroom and exploding. I had hallucinations like that. I had illusions. I heard music that wasn't there. Um, there was a small fruit fly in my room. You're, you know, these very tiny, tiny fruit flies. And when it passed my face, I, I was in shock of the noise because of the noise that that fruit fly made. So I had bruises everywhere, sleep apnea, hair loss, uh, mental confusion. Sometimes I woke up, I didn't know where I am. I'm confused, where am I? Or um, loss of appetite. Um, I lost 10 kg, so 20, um, 20 um, pounds. Um, loss of my hearing in my right ear, vertigo. Again, the list goes on, all right? I can't eat most of the foods now. I'm eating about 10 foods. Um, all right, so that is, that is the list, all right? I had all of that within four months, okay? Um, so um, are any, any doctors in the room? Any medical professionals in the room? Let's see, are there any medical professionals in the room? Yes, Dr. Tenyat. Yes, Ross. Yes, fantastic. All right, so we have doctors, maybe nurses. So just quiz quickly, myocarditis, inflammation of the heart is life-threatening, right? Um, the imbalance of electrolytes, severe imbalance, life-threatening, all right? Vasculitis, um, inflammation of the brain um, and inability um, to sleep at all. Um, am I right if I'm saying several of them are life-threatening? Okay. Um, now, what's important for you to realize, I was almost healed. So I was okay at 80% in my first long COVID recovery. And I went down the hill fast. And that's what I need you to understand, that you can go down the hill fast if you don't take care of yourself. And I'm going to take or, or your relatives, all right? And it can become uh, life-threatening. Okay, so let's continue. Oh, sorry. Just a sec, I lost you there. Okay, here you are. Okay. Okay. So, Someone said to me, oh, you had long COVID. I thought you had cancer when I said I was very ill. Well, I'm not sure if the, it's not about comparing, it's just, it shows you the lack of understanding um, among people, what's happening, not just with long COVID, but with a lot of illnesses that are currently misdiagnosed, including the excess, excess death rate, death uh, um, excess death we are seeing across the Western world um, as per national statistics, okay? And it's very important that we, that we uh, make clear here, I'm not buying into conspiracies, I'm looking at the data also, my own experience and the data. And we could just see in our own room here how many people are affected, all right? So what they said is post-COVID-19 symptoms, so long COVID were worse than cancer effects, all right? Cancer, cancer patients were very often still able to socialize or to meet people. H, stage four cancer, close to death, that's where the two are similar. When doctors become, so what I faced really were, was that I was very, very ill, but doctors did not know what to do. 
And you can see here when doctors become long COVID patients themselves and they are still not believed. We might have long COVID all wrong. What doctors still don't understand about long COVID, medical gaslighting harming long COVID patients. So what is really happening here, um, everyone, is that the majority of doctors, and they told me so, in the emergency departments, after I recovered with the electrolytes, okay, recovered, um, we don't know about long COVID. And they want to refer me to a long COVID clinic, which has three months of waiting. I feel I'm dying. And now they want to let me wait for three months. But they want to keep me for observation. And I was so sick that I felt any kind of shock, any kind of stress will push me over the edge. I was so sick that being in the emergency and they wanting to keep me for observations, telling me that they don't really know what to do or where to start to treat me. Um, I felt that was a risk and a threat to my survival. That's how sick I felt. The stress of the hospital, the doctors that are not know, that don't know what to do. All right. I was told again and again when I was by my family and my close friends, when everyone knew that I was very sick and my children were traveling alone back to Rwanda. Please go to hospital. But my journey towards self-healing was a deep-rooted instinct for my survival. And, and again, uh, you know, this is my story I'm sharing with you, um, the Africa Business Jump Status. Um, but I want to show you that there is another option. I was so sick. I don't think I just belonged into a hospital. There were times with my myocarditis and my vasculitis and my brain inflammation and you name it. I, there were times where I belonged in an ICU. But doctors had no idea if they're guessing. And that's, it started in Rwanda. You have heart disease. You need a pacemaker. You have, um, um, how do you say, um, the, sorry, the, um, okay, I, part of my brain fog. Um, and so the instinct for survival was that the, the, the lack of knowledge give her steroids. You know, by the way, if it, they had given me steroids, you can read the, the implications between steroids and um, the deficiency of, of um, electrolytes, all right? So I was locked in a bedroom in London. Um, so why was I and why are so many of you ill? That's the question we want to ask you, all right? I shared my story um, and I want to ask why are so many left with either taking medication or the doctors saying there's really no cure. And that includes your autoimmune diseases, you know, um, your cancer sometimes is not curable um, and there's no cure. Um, so yeah, your insomnia, your diabetes, your blood pressure is issues and so on, the list goes on. What is the overarching physical aspect no doctor talks about? and no pill or hospital treatment can cure. And I want to quickly check in with you. I still, I still paying attention. Can we have some of you back on video? Let's see. I still paying attention. And, you know, in terms of taking notes, I, I will put up everything on um, YouTube, but I will also happily share the slides with you if that is of, of uh, help at any point. Um, so, all right, um, so that is the question. And this is the question I want to answer. Why are there so many illnesses, autoimmune illnesses, cancers, and so on, where doctors are saying there's no cure? Or your choice is heavy medication. 
And here is what I learned, why that is, that there's either no cure or heavy medication and why I had so many symptoms, 56, a complete systemic collapse. What is the overarching physical aspect? Sorry. It's your nervous system. The question was, what is the overarching physical aspect no doctor talks about? And there is no pill or hospital treatment for that. It's your nervous system. Your nervous system um, is made up of you know, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Um, the central one is the brain and the spine. And all the nerves that are going through your body are your peripheral nervous system. One part of your nervous system, and as you can see, they're connected to all organs or almost all organs. And one part of your nervous system is there to activate your organs. And the other part of your nervous system is there to calm it down. This, the sympathetic nervous system is there to activate it and the parasympathetic nervous system is there to calm everything down. So look at this, your eyes, your vision, your glands, you talk about your pancreas and everything that creates insulin, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your spleen, your intestines, your stomach, your adrenal glands, your urinary bladder, your sexual organs, all of it is guided by your nervous system. When it is activated, it is your uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system. And when it is called to calm down and to rest, maybe because you're sleeping or you're resting, then uh, it's your parasympathetic nervous system. So my question, my question, really, my question, I need to, I need to see your faces again. My question to everyone is, if every organ in our body is directly linked to our nervous system, how is it then possible that no doctor talks about the nervous system as the number one potential reason for your organs and body misfunctioning. I tell you why. They don't study a lot of that in medical school. I mean, uh, sorry, we have some uh, medical doctors here, but there is a system and a lot of doctors are saying, we have to approach medicine a different way. There is no pill for your nervous system, the Africa Business Jump Status. There is no pill for your nervous system. There is no medication for your nervous system. And we're getting to that. But because I'm in the drive now, part of our medical system are the pharmaceuticals, and they're powerful. And I'll get to that in a minute because I needed to know more. And you know in, in a minute also why, because something else happened. And these pharmaceuticals are funding also a lot of the hospitals and the health associations. And there's no money to be made from healing your nervous system. And I'm 
sorry for the medical the medical experts here you know i you know it, it's not black and white and as a, again um uh medical staff has have saved my boy's life when he had an allergic reaction in Eritrea I'm forever grateful all right but we also have to understand that the medical system does not always know what is best for us sometimes it's it's, it's just lack of knowledge among doctors now for example about long COVID and we can't blame them it's lack of knowledge very often. But number two, it's also in the system. Lack of interest to cure you. That's the system. And we have to wake up to that. All right. So the medical system that is in charge of every single one of our organs is completely disregarded in, I would say, 90% of your hospital appointments. When I went to the experts here in terms of the cardiologists, and I don't blame them, they were wonderful doctors, it's what they learn and how they operate within the big system. They said to me, not, is there some, is there maybe a problem with the nervous system? They said, you may need a pacemaker. Can you imagine? Can you imagine cutting me open and putting a pacemaker in? All right, so let's continue. And I, I again, for those who are joining now, this is not my story, the Africa Business Jumpstart. This is your story. This is the story of your, you, as we heard, the wives and husbands that died. Those are the stories of your mothers and fathers that are ill, your sisters and brothers, your children. This is your story of your community. This is the story of our humanity with excess death across the Western world. Why are these people dying? All right, let's go back. And please keep your attention going. All right, so. So my journey to self-healing started, and we're gonna come back to, um, to um, um, you know, what needs to be done, I think. Uh, so this is the parting, so self-heal. There is another way. And I wanna tell you, no matter what your illness, if you have autoimmune disease, if you have cancer, if you have, I wholeheartedly believe, and this is my, opinion and again I, I I know sometimes this can get very personal I'm just sharing my journey and my opinion is I wholeheartedly believe you can self-heal anything remember my 56 symptoms and being so close to death can be compared to a cancer stage cancer stage four cancer um, patient who is also close to death what I want you to understand is that self-healing is not an act of waiting or resting. Whatever you have, your diabetes, your cancer, your autoimmune, your blood pressure issues, your, your um, digestive issues, your insomnia issues. If you think, let me just wait and, he, uh, wait and rest and I'll heal. No, that's not how it's going to happen. Instead, Self-healing is a consistent action to support your body and mind from various naturally inspired angles towards recovery, taking a holistic approach. So a holistic approach also means that if you are already very sick and you know your nervous system is very sick, um, and um, um, I should have also mentioned the the, the brain and the brain and gut axis, you know, because a lot of the brain, the sorry, the the, the nerves are en ending also in your in your gut. So the health of your gut, for example, is also very important. Of course, our body is one ecosystem, right? It is not one thing or the other. And I think that is the problem sometimes with medicine. They look at you compartmentalized. 
you go to the cardiologist for your heart and you go to an endocrine specialist, I don't know, with your hormone issues. And they look at it at a very compartmentalized kind of um, view. But our body, like a garden or beautiful nature, is a, is a ecosystem. Everything affects everything. All right. And therefore, when you self heal, it is not enough to just take one approach. So here's what's fundamental. If you want to take the, the, the journey towards self healing, and I'm sure some of you already have, wanting to heal and telling your mind and body the story of recovery and health. Right? So wanting to heal and telling your mind and body the story of health is important. If you tell your body and mind the story of sickness, it will remain in that state. And, and let me quickly go back. This is a very important aspect. Do you remember when I said in the beginning, and I'm feeling I'm losing some of you. Um, can we go back on video and just pay attention? Let's see. All right. No, there are many of you on video. It's just the first page showing me less. All right. Okay. So um, this is very important. Do you remember in the beginning, the headlines that said, there's a new crisis and that's the suicide crisis from long COVID. Can you imagine? People are feeling so sick, so desperate that they want to commit suicide because doctors don't know what to do with them and they're feeling helpless. And the reason why I did not feel suicidal, but instead felt more gratitude than I think I had ever felt in my life was for several reasons. Number one, self-healing was not new to me. It was a skill I already had. And that gave me the confidence. Number two, health is a passion of mine that many of you did not know. For years, since I am a teenager, holistic health, natural health. And so I had heard of many stories, even of cancer patients, where doctors said, sorry, there's nothing we can do, self-healing themselves. So that knowledge and the trust in self-healing and the trust in my ability to heal without the doctors gave me confidence. And then I was so grateful also because again, through other challenges I had gone in life, they had equipped me with gratitude. I was deeply grateful. I was grateful that I was in London and not in a war in Tigray or Ukraine. I was grateful that my kids were not babies anymore, but they could take care of themselves. I was grateful that I had a team who kept the business running and I didn't need to worry about finances. The list goes on. So, and that is, I think, really so important because sometimes we get so locked up, this is to all of you, in the feeling of I'm sick, I'm unwell, I'm in pain and you feel maybe miserable or depressed or maybe anxious or you feel like life is not as much fun as it used to be. You worry. And when you are in that state of, of th that's the story of sickness. And maybe you're running from doctor to doctor to doctor. And maybe you have done so for the last two years or five years and 10 years, and you're still not healed. Maybe it is time to tell yourself a different story. A story of health and healing. And if I can do it, thinking that I'm almost dying with 56 symptoms, and many of them life-threatening, you can do it. I will not lie, there were desperate moments, especially night times when everyone is at sleep 
and I'm wide awake thinking my heart is stopping or I'm not making it. Yeah, I had these moments and they're human. But I would say 80 to 90% of the time feeling so sick, I went in a me meditative stage and I, I just said, I'm healing. I'm spending Christmas with my kids. I'm seeing myself on a terrace in Rwanda. And this is, this is the story I told myself. And guess what? All the 56 symptoms you see now, I did not know it was that many. I was not ready to tell myself the story of sickness when I was so sick. So I did not list my symptoms. The people, I stayed at my friend, best friend's house. Her mom is also very sick. So um, I didn't give her that stress after I arrived here in Rwanda. To this day, she doesn't know how sick I was in that bedroom. She could see what she sees. She had to help me to go to toilet, things like that. She does not know how sick I was because I would not tell that story of sickness. It was a taboo for me because as soon as I do, I bring it into my awareness and I did not want to die. And therefore I told my body and my mind and my heart and my spirit and my soul every single moment of the day that everything will be fine. Why? Because I can see myself on that terrace in Rwanda, enjoying the sunshine. All right? So I was also in isolation, first of all, because I was too sick to speak to anyone. But of course, sometimes I had my dad calling in to check on me and very two very close friends. And even them, I, I, I just explained like this, you know, explained so they would understand like, please speak, speak quietly or slowly. I cannot follow what you're saying, things like that. Um, but um, I did also not tell them how really sick I was. Okay, so going back. Um, and again, this is not my story. It's everyone's story. All right. So tell you, tell this, tell the story of cell health is fundamental, okay? So going to the next. Fundament, fundamental number two, you have to believe that it is possible and have some knowledge of what to do to support your body to self-heal. So if, if you have never self-healed from anything or you, you are, don't even know where to start or what it means, um, you know, it's, it's a bit more difficult because you don't have the confidence. And that's what I wanna share to, with you today. I got some very important tips also for the, from the CFS community, which is the chronic fatigue syndrome community that I did not know. Two of them, number one is the pacing, all right? Pacing means to do less than you have energy for, write that down. It's very important. You have a baseline if you're already sick or unwell. You need to pace yourself. You need to every day do less than you have energy for, especially when you have chronic fatigue syndrome. And again, many women have that as an autoimmune condition. And the reason why people are sick for 20 or 30 years is they will feel better and then they wanna do things, right? They wanna meet people and go out or cook or whatever, and they get a relapse. So you always have to stay below your baseline. And a small relapse is uh, uh, necessary, but you don't want to um, crash again. And that the nervous system recovery is more important than any supplement or physical aspect in the body. That is something I learned from the chronic fatigue syndrome community, long COVID community of people who had healed. I did not know that, all right? And in the beginning, I was shuffling in all sorts of natural supplements. They have their place, and I will share that. But the nervous system recovery, calming your nervous system is the overarching important thing, all right? So therefore, yes, we have heard, oh, are you stressed? Maybe you're stressed, you know? But your stress or the stresses of the nervous system can 
kill you. All right, they are, let's have a quick look, illness, for example, the virus, okay, or a V, all right, because you are injecting parts of the virus again, um, or pre-existing imbalances, okay, they are a shock to your nervous system. Why? Because the nervous system is also in charge of your immune system. All right. Strong pharmaceutical medication is a shock to the nervous system because a lot of them are chemicals. They're toxins. Um, Work-life imbalance, full day schedules, your responsibility running up and down, negative thoughts, the people who overthink, okay? Your emotional negative thoughts, negative news, electronics, your TV, especially the big TV screens, bright light, fast moving images on TV. So the TV is a combination of things, the bright light, the fast moving images, the voice, and then trying to follow the story. Your nervous system in front of a big TV screen is in complete overdrive. You think you're relaxing in the evening. Multitasking, bright room lights, noise, a messy surrounding chaos or clutter in your house. Um, they have found that um, and people who have chaos and clutter in their house um, have um, more, in, you know, have sleeping problems and the sleeping, the insomnia um, improves after they have tidied up their house, for example, all right? Heavy processed foods, a gut imbalance, all right? So the processed foods. Uh, other people's emotions or stories. So you may be listening to your best friend and she's maybe, um, she's very upset or crying, you know, um, but that also stresses your, emo uh, your nervous system, your fears and your subconscious pains and traumas and the old story you're telling yourself. All right, so these are your stresses, the Africa Business Jump Starters. Please look at them. And the reason why I know so, so detailed now is because I could not have any of them. In fact, I still don't have most of them around me seven months later. Um, and this is the first time I'm sitting under bright light. Um, all right, so these are your stresses. This is what makes your nervous system sick. Here are early signs that your nervous system is stretched. And I'm talking about early, early quiet signs. Let me just check. Um, Ayla, can you still see and hear me? Always checking with you, great, thank you. Okay, here are very subtle early signs. Tinnitus in your ear, or tinnitus, I don't know how you, call, how you pronounce it in English. So, you know when you, were, you had a lot of TV, or you were at a party, and then you go to sleep, and then your ear does like, you know that? And you feel like the TV is still in your ear, or the music. It's your nervous system. Dry eyes, hand, and feet. If you have itchy eyes, dry eyes, it could just be a nervous system being overly stretched. And I can tell now my hands are drying up when, when my nervous system is overly overstretched. And when I do my relaxation exercise, half an hour later, my, the dryness has stopped. So these are subtle signs and we're so busy, we don't hear them. These are the subtle signs, okay? Headaches, a hardened stomach, you feel like you have stones in the belly and you think like, what did I eat? You didn't eat anything. It's your vagus nerve finding its end in your stomach and it's upset. And that's why your stomach hardens or your stomach starts making noises, rumbling. You think, okay, I mean, if you're very hungry, but that's also your nervous system, your gut giving your nervous system um, uh, how do you say, uh, messages. But this, I, I had it very strongly and I was on strict fasting. So it had nothing to do with the food. It is your vagus nerve in your stomach. Oh yeah, here we go. Rumbling stomach or a light stomach upset. 
less energy. Suddenly you feel tired, you know, climbing that stair, you're a bit out of breath, lower ability to sleep. You slept well the last night, but now you're sleeping less. Um, and insomnia is a big one because I went from 90 minutes per night with inflamed brain, 90 minutes per night for a month, I went to 11 hours of sleep equally for a month. And that was my healing sleep. 11 hours sleep deep, uh, deep sleep. So I became an expert on insomnia too. Um, if, yeah, I, I, maybe I go into that um, a little um, bit later because I know a lot of you suffer from insomnia. You don't need any pill. There's a very um, simple way to um, cure your insomnia. And maybe remind me if that's important to you. And feeling suddenly cold. Do you know that feeling where you're like, oh, I need to maybe put a jacket on. A lot of women get that, right? That's your nervous system. And muscle or acupressure points, points they pain you. Okay. So for example, let's do a quick test among all of you. Acupressure points. I want you to, where am I? I can't see even myself. I want to wrong. Okay. All right. So acupressure points. I want all of you to find this part in on your hand. Raise all your hands. Can let's see. You're all beautifully on me. Okay, yes. And then very deep, close to the bone. Press it with your thumb. Press it quite hard. Press it quite hard. Go a little bit towards the index finger, a little bit here. Okay, let me see it, show, show you again. Let me go on. Okay, so uh, here, okay, go a little bit here and then you go maybe a little bit here. Okay, press hard and see if it pains. Okay, let's say, who, who feels nothing? Who feels, who feels some pain? Oh yeah, there's some sore pain. Can, oh, let's see in the text. Do you feel some pain? Okay, I feel pain, I feel pain, it hurts. It hurts, pain, pain. Okay, nothing, nothing. I feel pain, pain, I feel pain. Nothing, I feel pain, 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 ouch, pain. Mm -hmm. Try it on the left hand and try it on the right hand and see if there's a problem. When I squeeze very hard, I feel pain, yeah. See if there's a difference, okay. Let me tell you something. For those of you that feel pain, it's not a good sign. Meaning, number one, your nervous system is in overdrive and you have probably some kind of inflammation in your body. And if you feel a lot of pain, your, your nervous system is out of balance and you have quite a lot of inflammation in your body. And this one is more... Uh, or you have high blood pressure, that is also. So the amazing thing is, and look, I had very high blood pressure just laying in bed. I couldn't take any medication. First of all, I didn't believe in it. But second, one hour later, I, my blood pressure would drop on its own, so low that I felt like I'm fainting. Guess what? For those of you who have high blood pressure, press this for 30 to 60 seconds and your blood pressure is coming down. That was one of my secret pills because the blood pressure would rise and rise and rise and I would be in bed pressing this and each time it would come down. All right, so this one is more related from my experience, I'm not an expert, to my blood pressure and to my breathing. If you suffer from anxiety here, this is your pressure point and just normal relaxation. This one for me is more related to my heart. When I have myocarditis or my heart gets inflamed, this one hurts. And it hurts a little bit today, um, which means you know I have to be a bit careful. All right, so, so this is, this is a, a, just a, a quick tip. And you have these acupressure points everywhere in your body. The most are on your feet and your hands, and they tell you a lot about your health. If any of them hurt, because these, these are your nerve ends, if any of them hurt, 
you have a, if they really hurt badly, you already have illness in your body. That's it. You can massage them and pressure them to release or, or um, to, to help this, the nervous system to relax. And as a result of that, slowly over time, the, the illness that is related to that nerve, you know, specific one, for example, um, will also relax and calm, calm down, okay? All right, let's go back. So that was my medicine for my high blood pressure and my anxieties. Okay. All right, so the hormones of stress will make you ill and they can kill you. And we have to realize that. We have to realize that. All right. Um, it's not being mentioned strongly enough by the medical community. All right, here are your in pictures, the bright lights, the busy work schedule, no rest. Because our society is telling us, you know, oh, he's a hard worker. And we take pride in that. We forget to rest. We're multitasking. We want to achieve everything, you know, and we forget to rest. Okay. So one thing that is also very important for you is Amy. I call her Amy. Amy is the red part of your brain, the amygdala. So the amygdala is um, a small part of your brain which is very important. And because I was stuck in my own body and bedroom, I call her Amy. And I started speaking to Amy every single day because Amy is your fight, flight, or freeze engine. Okay? So can you see those guys running away from a bear that's a photo shoot go gone wrong? <laughs> so what happens is, Amy is on, she's, in, she's, uh, she's cracking it right now. And she's saying, run. So the problem is that our world and our lives have become so stressful that we are constantly in the mode of fighting or fleeing, or freezing. Amy is in overdrive, the amygdala, part of our brain. And that's why I kept talking to Amy. Because someone says something on the phone, this is me being sick. And very, my nervous system is very sick. Someone says something on the phone, very innocent. Amy is Pew, pew, pew. And all my symptoms flare up. A police car runs by. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah, literally, not just the police car, Amy too. And now my body is like in overdrive, relapse. It is everything. It was the fruit fly, the police car, um, the, the people listening to music inside, you know, in the house. My friend lived in an apartment. It was the food, it was everything. Amy thought she was under attack. And the reason why Amy thought she was under attack was, number one, I had led a stressful life running my business as a single mom. And number two, she dealt with the COVID virus followed by the V, all right? And that was too much. That combination was too much for, for Amy to take. And now Amy thought, and then, you know, you have, of course, other things also going on in your life. We're all humans. And Amy thought, oh, I'm under attack. And she goes out of sync with the entire nervous system. And that's how we get also autoimmune diseases. Our body is starting to be out of sync the immune system, it starts attacking ourselves, basically. The cells don't operate anymore. The mast cells are out of whack. Everything is dysfunctioning. So here's then what relaxes 
the nervous system and heals you. Isolation is a big one. I can't, isolation is important because as much as you can, because the people around us are also a trigger of stress, sleep, silence. You can read them. So I can breathe a little bit. All right, the list goes on. All right. Okay, so I tried to put in green, which I think if you said, okay, out of all of them, what helped you most? It's those in green, I would say, but here is what I said earlier. I did, no, not I did. I am doing all of them since late August, every single day. Maybe the last one, the releasing of old trauma is not a daily one. All of the others, I'm doing all of them every single day day for the last seven months. That is how I self-healed. And remember I said earlier that self-healing is not an act of waiting or hoping or relaxing on the sofa watching movies. If you're so sick, maybe that you can't leave the house anymore. Self-healing, I repeat it, is an act of first believing you can self-heal and then supporting your body to actively self-heal. Self-healing is work. Self-healing is self-discipline. Okay, so again, I will share, you will see it on YouTube or I'll share the slides with you. Um, I wanna say a few things to some of them. Oops. All right, this is the food I'm eating currently. That's all I have since late August, seven months. So on the left, you can see it only has eggs, mushrooms. I had in London, I had goat's cheese, which I don't have here in Rwanda. Um, a lot of herbs, salad and apple. That was on the left. You can see since I'm in Rwanda, I added things, but it's pretty much the same thing I added the biggest thing I think I added is really um, uh, the sweet potato, which is carbs. I, I didn't have any carbs for four months, but I was losing so much weight. So um, sweet potatoes have a, a lot of nutritious values. So as you can see, the only thing that's cooked is eggs. The reason why, I, and the eggs I'm adding are organic free range eggs. In, in London, my friend bought the eggs for me, a very, these are, uh, they're called, um, um, what are they, Brownford Red or something. So they're very rare kind of dark eggs, um, not in this particular picture, but, um, and even now the local eggs, so free range organic eggs, and they're full of nutrition. Um, the whole story of your eggs are not healthy. That's for mass produced eggs. Eggs are very healthy and they give you a whole range of nutrition. Um, I have sometimes, four or five eggs per day since August. It's part of my healing story. Mushrooms, and as you can see, all right? So light meals. I, I did a lot of fasting for you who are interested. Um, so usually um, I had days where I fasted for 24 hours. I had days where I didn't eat anything for 48 hours for two days. And the fasting when I had high inflammation where my entire body was burning, the two days of fasting kind of, put the flames down. My inflammation is still happening, but it put the flames down, okay? Now I um, eat about one meal a day. What you see, that's what I eat in a day, okay? Um, number two, this is my living room, all right? So on the upper, upper um, end, you can see my living room during the night lit up with the lights, just as you can see me now on the screen. But I've changed that because 
when I was very ill in London, I could not stand any light, not even of my mobile phone, any light that is um, artificial light. And so I have taken notice that this is not good for me. Um, so I bought these, um, what are they called? Uh, yeah, I can't see them, filament vintage uh, lights. Yeah, I bought them. Look, you can get them on Amazon. Put it down, order those, order those. Your very bright light in your home in the evening is very bad for your nervous system. Very bad. Okay, so you can order these lights on Amazon, change some of the lamps in your bedroom, the small lamps, so you can see on the lower images below what my bedroom, uh, sorry, it's not my bedroom, my living room looks, and we have a kitchen attached to that, okay? It actually doesn't look as dark, it's the camera maybe, but yeah, it's a little bit like 100 years ago with candlelight, and candlelight is also very good for you. So one thing that you have in the evening, and if you want to do one good thing for your nervous system, for your health and for your insomnia, to heal your insomnia, is switch off those very bright artificial lights in the evening. And on top of it, you have a TV screen like right shining right at you. Much better if you're healing, you're self-healing, or even if you have kids, watch a lot, lot of TV, much better is to sit in a laptop on a laptop where you have a smaller screen and you could can dim the brightness of your laptop screen. Much healthier. And that's something that I could do after a while. I couldn't do it in the beginning, but after a while dimming the laptop, I could do it. TV screens, I still can't do, okay? Grounding, dear Africa Business Jump Status, I cannot tell you. This is one of my main healing methods. And I started this mainly in Rwanda. And this is walking around bare feet. I didn't have shoes on for the last three, four months, except when I go to the toilet or bathroom, I put slippers on. I'm walking around bath, bath, bath barefoot for the last three to four months. And I'm in the grass also in the garden. I know many of you have gardens or even balconies. Um, and I'm also laying on the grass. And the grounding or earthing, look what it can do. Here, this is also running around bare feet. This is something very simple you can do for your nervous system, for your health. Take your shoes off right now. <laughs> you know, when you walk around, start today towards better health. Here, grounding or earthing, it reduces inflammation. It reduces chronic pain, spreads, speeds healing, improves sleep. The list goes on. And look what this is. This is, this is the grounding and earthing experts showing people, you know, this, uh, they're showing the, um, uh, the ultrasounds. Or, uh, um, on the left is before the grounding. Can you see how much inflammation this guy has in his lungs or in his upper body? And then after grounding, look, the inflammation is gone. Look at this one, the legs inflamed, the knees inflamed on the left. Half an hour laying on the grass or walking outside in the garden with bare feet or even inside your house. Uh, but important is more better if you can is outside. I know for some of you it's winter, it doesn't matter. If you're healing, you go to a park in London, in New York, who cares? You're walking around bare feet, okay? This is very powerful. I do this every day, uh, about four, five, six times a day. I mean, the, the, the laying in the grass, I run around barefoot the whole time. The next thing I wanna share is Kijong acupressure, especially uh, Master uh, Qian Lin. He's been a lifesaver for me. Uh, he teaches Kijong, which is like a Tai Chi, and he also, um, um, yeah, some acupressure also, but I had other experts for acupressure. So here is the beauty with Ki Kijong. Many of you are not able to exercise. We are always told exercise. Guess what? Some of us are so sick, we can't exercise. 
For some of us are so old, we can't exercise anymore. But the beauty about Qigong is it's gentle. And I started, I started with my acupressure in, in, um, in the bed when I could hardly move. I started moving my hands. That's how I started pressing my hands. Sometimes I was too tired to even press, moving my feet. That's how I started. And then Qigong, all right? Yes, I like that. Some people are getting up exactly, fantastic. So let me show you a few exercises in Qigong. Let's get up, everyone. It's about healing ourselves. Let's get up, let's get up. Very gentle, it's very gentle. And that's the beauty, let's get up. All right, most of you are up. Okay, so I have to look at myself. I hope you can see, see me, it's a bit, let me, let me that chair. Okay. So Qigong is all about feeling the life energy, the Qi in your body. And it's about um, healing your nervous system. And one exercise, is very simple. You breathe, you lift your arms. You can watch me first and then you go, when you close your eyes and you breathe out. Very slowly. And then you put your hands on your belly. And you breathe a couple of times. And you do it again. Up. And rest on the belly. OK? And Master Lin says, this is the amazing thing, what he says, and I'm doing this every day, is another exercise. You take your two hands. While one goes up, almost like in a wheel, the other one goes down. You're basically spinning them in front of you. Yeah, okay, I have the cable here. Up to your head. And you want to do it very slowly. So if you're going like this, that's, this is wrong, yeah? It's all about closing your eyes and feeling the energy. Or your body is calming down very slowly. And if you cannot stand because you're too sick, you can do it sitting. So these are some of the best and easiest Qigong exercise. And the beauty with Qigong is, and the other one is clapping, clapping your, here, your arms because the nerves are in here, okay? The nerves are in here and also your calves, okay? And you, I'm telling you, it is one of the fastest, fastest relaxation exercise to relax your nervous system. Take notes or watch this YouTube, this video again, please. I do this several times a day. You can do it before you sleep, all right? If you do grounding before you sleep, you take off the lights, do the grounding before you sleep, do this exercise, 10 minutes, five will help you greatly, okay? So what I like about uh, Master Lin, he says, if you believe it, it will work. If you don't believe it, it will still work. And he says, with this exercise, you can cure anything, including cancer, which is amazing, which just shows how our medical system approaches things completely different from you know, some of the, 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 the Chinese medicine, for example. And this is thousands of years old, and he says it can heal cancer, okay? All right, so back. So these are some of the things I do, still do every single day. All right, very quickly, of course, you know, vitamin D um, is important, the sun. But what you may not have known is that it decreased COVID mortality during the pandemic in the ICUs by 50 to 75%. And these are studies from Italy and Saudi Arabia. Those people who had enough vitamin D in their body had a 50 to 75% higher survival rate in the ICU than those who did not have vitamin D in the body. Wake up, call. And if you do not have sun, if you're in Africa, get into the sun, especially the morning and the evening sun. If you do not have sun, go into the light. The light is important and heals too. 
if you cannot leave the house, take vitamin D. And vitamin D, not as they say, 1,000 units, you need at least four to 10,000. And there are no side effects. You can take 15 to 20,000 units, all right? There are no side effects. That's another, you know, especially if you have autoimmune diseases, you have to upgrade your vitamin D and it will take time until it actually stays in your body, you know, and they are reserves. And this is very, very crucial for your healing. No matter what illness you have, go and order your vitamin D, please write it down, especially those of you in the winter now. And don't take the 1000 units that they're selling across a lot of pharmacies. Tell them, give me the highest. What do you have? If they have 4,000 units, then take two of them. Maybe start with 4,000, take two of them. You can, without a problem, go up to 10,000. Even 15 or 20,000 is safe. So 10,000 is absolutely safe, okay? 1,000 will do nothing for you. 1,000 equals around 15 minutes out in the sun for a, a, a white person, 15 minutes. For a black person, it equals five minutes in the sun. So 1,000 does nothing for you, okay? You need the higher doses, okay? Here, look, this is how they treated people in hospitals a few decades ago. We forgot all of that knowledge. They put kids in the children's hospital out into the sun because they knew it was healing. Now it's all just tablet after tablet, medication after medication, or there is no cure. And then also, of course, you have industry, not just the pharmaceutical industry, but a lot of other industries who are financing also um, the research. Can the sun be dangerous? Yes, of course. If you are there for four hours in the heat of Mallorca, Mallorca and you have no protection whatsoever, no clothes or anything, and you get red or burned or your skin peels off, of course, and if you do that for years. But it is a madness how we are being told, put sunscreen on so you stay wrinkleless and young. And now you have a, a, a lot of uh, 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 black ladies, and I need to go back to see your faces, black ladies and men, putting sun cream on in the name of beauty. I tell you something, the vitamin D you get through the sun is one of the best vitamins to keep you young. It actually reduces your wrinkles. It is only when you're really damaged that your skin is damaged, vitamin D and the sun will increase your youth. But hey, all these industries and big companies are powerful and they're putting this research out there and then they're putting it into the media. And guess what? Guess who sits on this board of these big media channels? It's the same industry. All right. So um, as for me, I mean, now I've aged because of long COVID. I've always told, um, I'm 45, by the way, um, no secrets anymore. Um, I've always told, I've always been told um, I look young. I have never used a sun cream in my life, nor have I shunned the sun in my life. I just naturally. So sun is not only good, it keeps you young, but it can heal you. It is a healer. So we should not be afraid of the sun, okay? Um, Unless, of course, again, if you're in the in the greatest heat for hours, uh, sunbathing or so. Um, this one is a big one. Write it down. Red light therapy. This is a very important one. And by a good one, this one is from Beura, which is a, a German company. You want a good one, all right? Not some kind of cheap red light. Here is what this is important for you. Everyone should have a red light lamp at home. Okay, number one, all of you who had the COVID V, okay, you know what I'm talking for, for about. 
we have spike proteins in our body and they create a lot of damage from the, okay? Um, you may feel the damage or you may not feel the damage, but it's in your body if you got that thing. So the red light therapy is taking down the spike proteins um, just within, the studies have been down, done within four days. And you just sit in front of that for 10 minutes. Look, I got it here, it's mine. Okay, so um, uh, I do it about 80 centimeters a meter uh, distance, so you don't wanna get burned. Um, and uh, I do it five minutes in the front, five minutes in the back. Uh, and of course, on a naked body, right? Um, it can, number one, it takes the spike proteins down of um, the number one. Number two, any inflammation you have in the body. And guess what? Most of us have inflammation in the body because we are, why? We are living very stressful lives. That's why our nervous system hardly ever rests. And um, the red, infrared light, um, takes down the inflammation in your body. So it's very healing. You also get it naturally with the morning sun and the evening sun. So if you have a garden and there's morning sun at 7 a.m., get out. You get natural red uh, infrared light, the same for the evening, okay? So when I focused on the nervous system in isolation, 45 of my 56 symptoms cleared and healed in four months including my life-threatening condition. Okay. I healed all of them, not, not all of them, 45 or 56. Right now I have about five left. Okay. So I did not take medication. I took supplements, if for those of you who want to know, and I can natural supplements, you know, the vitamin C and zinc, and I, I, I can tell you quickly also what those were if you're interested. Um, but they were supportive, which is good. But the main focus was on calming down my nervous system and take every stress out. I then got curious and I studied, you know, this is the last uh, month or so when I got better, because before that even I couldn't watch much YouTube, it was too overwhelming. And I started the blue zones of this world. The blue zones of this world are in Loma Linda, California, in Nokoya, um, I think that was that, uh, that Mexico, or, yeah, meh, no, it wasn't Mexico. Anyway, Southern America, Sardinia, Italy, Icaria, Greece, and, and Oka, Okiava, was it called? I can't read it, Okinawa. Okinawa, Japan. Okay, so the, the why I became interested in those blue zones is, in, you may have heard of it, people here, the, a lot of people are getting out over 100 years. They become 110, they become 120, and it has been fascination for, for experts and researchers why people in those areas become so old and they don't get sick, they don't age like people in the West age with all these illnesses and dying in hospital, um, you know, and I have been fascinated and I followed the stories. I followed travelers who speak to people who live in those areas. And, um, and a lot of focus was given on food because this is again what we as the um, kind of Western society think, but guess what? They ate, they, they, they ate, yes, they ate quite healthy, but it's not like they were um, feeding off uh, uh, superfoods and salads, you know. Um, in Okinawa, for example, they fried their fish, they deep fried their fish. They even had things from cans, you know, this, um, because the Americans were the ones freeing them um, or, or giving them food actually after the Second World War, war funnily enough. So, um, they have a lot of American um, habits, also in terms of their eating, eating habits. But yeah, they have fish and all sorts of things as well, vegetables and beans. So a lot of them had a lot of beans. So there was a lot of focus on how important beans are. Um, not a problem for me in Rwanda, everyone eats beans. Um, 
But here is really what I realized because their nutrition was simple, um, but not, nothing where you said, okay, that will keep you going for 120 years. Here is what I really, really realized when I followed those videos. Number one, they were all kind of isolated from the rest of the world. Look, three of them are islands. And then Nicoya is also almost like a half island. And Loma Linda, which interestingly is in California, guess what? They're saying the rest of California doesn't consider us to be Californians because we are so different. And there, a lot of them are the, the Mormons. So they live in an isolated state from the rest of society. So what we get is number one, a lot of isolation on their island within their community, away from the, the buzz of the world, the, the, you know, the, the, the big news and the, the problems of the world. So there was a lot of isolation. Then there was a lot of contact with nature. So all of them lived kind of in, in a lot of with nature. And there was a lot of, um, half of them in Icaria and uh, okay, now they said we don't have watches. So they don't follow the watch, all right? And there was a lot of community coming together. And there was a lot of focus on cooking and cooking together and enjoying community activities together in an isolated state away from the world next to nature. So what I realized then, it's not the food after all, I believe. It's the nervous system. <laughs> they have a healthy nervous system. And they live close to the sea also. That's another idea. They have a healthy nervous system. Um, and that was just confirmed what I said. And that's why they live so long. And a healthy nervous system is also the community and the coming together in community spirit, not the, 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 the stress of loneliness, for example. And so, yeah, this is, for example, the food here quickly um, from Japan. I mean, it's what, to be honest, this is what I eat. So, um, yeah, it's healthy kind of, but uh, it's not like um, out of this world. I don't think that the, the real factor is the food, it's just contributing. It's they live in a state of well being, of relaxation, of going with nature and the flow in their community. And so, um, you know, they, they were saying even um, they're healthy up to 120, at 100 years old, they're doing their own households, you know, no one is looking after them at 100 or 105. They're going out, playing together, including the old ones. And they said even their sexual life, many of them at 80 years old, women and men at 80 years old are still sexually active. They have regular sex with their partners. It's because even that part is attached to the nervous system. And if we are stressed out, it doesn't function properly anymore. Okay, so... Here is another eye opener and a very important one that I haven't mentioned yet. One important factor you need to heal. I relapsed in January with myocarditis after some emotional stress, nothing major really. Being back home among people and preparing for normal life resulted in some old thought habits, which brought me to phase number two of my self healing healing my traumas, becoming the person who is healthy on a deeper level. And um, this one is very, very important um, because if someone had asked me, have you suffered trauma in life? My answer would have said, would have been no. Uh, because very often of trauma, we think of, um, that's some, you know, and uh, again, if this brings something up in, in some of you, maybe you want to quieten the, the microphone, but maybe this is also your time to face it. For some of us, trauma means rape, 
um, or um, war, war or being completely disregarded by our parents. Um, but what I've learned is, or it could be post-generational trauma. I learned from my African-American friends about the, um, the generational trauma um, after slavery. So that is, that is a slave, that is, that is a trauma that's been passed on. Um, but what I also learned is um, that most of us have trauma. We just don't recognize it or we kind of shovel it aside. So if, for example, you have um, you have experienced abuse, abuse in a relationship, and many of us women have emotional abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, financial abuse, it's a trauma. And you may hang on to that. If you've been hit by your husband, um, you may hang on to that 20 years later, to that pain. Yeah. Someone you trusted maybe, a, a, a boyfriend, a partner, a girlfriend, a wife, a parent. You loved them and you trusted them and they betrayed you. There are many forms of betrayal, many forms of betrayal. And so, you know, it, it, could, it could be so many things. Maybe you went through an accident. Something that happened to you could be a trauma that you're still holding on. So what I've learned, and I did not know that, is that our brain and our nervous system store the experience, the information for years and decades because it was such an important um, part in our life. Very often it started during childhood that the nervous system and the brain are keeping that information so that it is ready to react in case something similar happens again. I did not know that. And again, I didn't think I had trauma until I, I read what trauma can be. And, or I thought I had kind of lived or worked through it because I have experienced uh, abuse in a love relationship. So, you know, when you, how do you notice if you have trauma also how you deal with it? Number one, you shuffle it aside. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to remember it. You don't want other people to talk about it or mention it. You come, you shut off, you put a wall. Of it. And yes, that is a common kind of reaction because we want to protect ourselves. I don't want to go there. The problem is the trauma is, is in your body's energy. And, and um, I really look deeply into that. Um, so um, the second thing is to know if you have trauma is if you mention it. So as an example, um, you know, you, you could mention it like, um, you think you can do that? That's what your dad used to do to me. And it just comes out like that. That is unresolved trauma when you become emotional about something or people treat you a certain way. It can be a stranger, can be a family member, can be a friend. And you react with anger or you feel depressed after or you feel the pain, you start crying you become, or you become aggressive. When you overreact emotionally, very often it's because your stored energy or the nervous system, the brain recognizes something and you say, not with me, but you're not aware that this is your old trauma very often, or it has become a part of your thinking or your reaction 
in life towards other people. Very often your overreaction or your, your coping mechanisms could be alcohol, could be going out to forget everything, could be work, work becoming a workaholic, uh, it could be becoming depressed, it could be becoming overthinking, it could be eating, all sorts of action we take. And even the ones who think they do not have trauma here, that's me. I had to face that one. So, And then of course, again, we have generational trauma as well, right? After slavery or for example, Rwandese have a generational trauma. And I think a lot of nations have generational trauma if something very bad happened in their, in their country that has been traumatizing on a collective level. And maybe, maybe Africans across the world have generational trauma, not just from slavery, through the US in West Africa, we were also enslaved by, um, uh, by Arabs, for example, in Eastern Africa. Or, or um, the, 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 um, the, col the colonization of Africa. That, that is passed on that trauma. Um, so, so how did I heal my trauma? So first of all, I needed to be aware. I was aware of it through Dr. Joe Dispenza, all right? On what you're focusing your energy every day when that could, uh, on what are you focusing your energy every day when that could be used to heal yourself? And he says, every time we have a thought, we make a chemical. If we have good thoughts, we make chemicals that make us feel good. And if we have negative thoughts, we make chemicals that make us feel exactly the way we are thinking. And therefore, our thoughts can make us sick. And therefore, if you're upset with people in your family or with your partners, you know, um, family members and partners is a big one, all right? Um, because they get to us because we care and we love, love them. Um, and very often, what are your patterns? And this is, this is not some kind of woo-woo thing, right? But when you go through it in your mind also, the negative thoughts, this is what she did again, or this is what he did again. Um, um, and you feel the pain over it, and it becomes a pattern over years. Maybe even from someone you're still in a relationship now, be it family or or love relationship. And when you go through this again and again and again, just through your thoughts, your body releases certain chemicals. Remember, Amy, your body goes into flight or fight or freeze. And that means just through thought alone. And that creates now emotions. The chemicals create emotions. You feel sadness or betrayal or you know, it could be also your trauma of what you have done. Maybe you feel guilt or shame or anxiety or worries or, you know, I mean, all these negative emotions are coming up and they create illness in you. And I did not realize that until January where I was interacting again, again with people and I started thinking and this caused, um, these were my traumas and they caused myocarditis inflammation of my heart, which is not pleasant. You feel like you're fainting, dying, or your heart is stopping, all right? Okay, so, um, so I released my trauma through first recognizing it, naming it what it was, and then meditating. Uh, and then first you're crying maybe your heart out, um, and because you're realizing the pattern um, throughout the years um, and you need to free yourself from that. You're basically a prisoner of your traumas and you cannot be free from that until you heal your traumas. It's very, very important. Um, and then also the next thing is that I said, um, let me become the person 
that doesn't hang on to that trauma anymore, the person that is healed, okay? Um, just very quickly, I, I think I need to be quicker now. So these are people that just followed Dr. Joe Dispenza's meditation. And I wanna say, I'm sure some of you are familiar with him through the power of meditation alone. One of them, the black lady, she had a thyroid removed because the doctor said, we have to remove your thyroid. She regrew her thyroid in the medical, Medi medical experts will tell you it is not possible to regrow your thyroid. Once it's gone, you've lost it. She regrew her thyroid. All the other three are stage four cancer victim, uh, cancer patients, sorry, where the, 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 the doctors had given up and they said, sorry, we tried everything. There's not much we can do or it's too late or whatever. They healed themselves through deep meditation, but not on their own, um, some of them on their own over months, but these particular ones went through a um, one week workshop with Dr. Joe Dispenza. And because it's one week in isolation, you're away from your world. And this is so important why isolation is so crucial for healing. Because you have certain patterns and actions and thoughts and chemicals and habits in the world you know. And isolation will help you to get away from those habits and those people. And so within a week of uh, medi uh, meditation, they healed their traumas and they became uh, new people, basically um, resetting their nervous system and they healed their cancers. And there are many testimonials. Some of them bring their, um, how do you say, their um, scans and so on. So if you want to learn about that, follow Dr. Joe Dispenza and start with the testimonials. Um, anything can be healed. And um, he's one of the leading world experts. For me, I think he's one of the best uh, leaders in this world um, towards changing yourself to become the person that is healthy or wealthy or happy or in love, all right? Um, so there's one more raw truth, and I think I've kept you for, for too long. You can see now how passionate I am, but I, I really hope, I don't know, I really hope it's worth the time. There's one more thing. I found a lump in my right breast after all of that. Um, and, um, you know, you feel like, okay, you've just overcome the whole thing, all right? Um, and it's here in the upper part of my right breast, uh, it's a lump, okay? It has never been there, it doesn't belong there. It's been there for over two months now. Now, just quickly, they're saying cancer occurrence as the upcoming complications of long COVID. Long COVID may accelerate the cancer progress. And then Dr. Tina Pierce, who is an expert on long COVID um, in the UK, um, I followed her just to see the latest from her. And she said her breast cancer patient because she's a, a woman expert, doctor. She said her, her breast cancer patient, she has been a doctor for 30 or 40 years, breast cancer occurrence in the last year, year and a half, grew by 400 to 500% in her practice. Yeah. So, yeah. Remember the V-word? Yeah. And uh, this is all, I, for me, this is the only thing that would make sense if you research. And I started research because I found a lump in my breast that doesn't belong there. All right. And it's in the upper part here where everything is kind of, um, how do you say, it? you know, you have cysts sometimes around your, your, your breast tissue. But in the upper part here, it's quite firm. And there is a lump that doesn't belong there. Now, here's the thing. I started researching first, I panicked, all right? Kind of, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So uh, first, yeah, of course, I panicked. I, had, I was scared. My first instinct was, okay, I need to know. I need to check out. There is a center here, a diagnostic center in King Faisal Hospital, and by the way, you're the first, no one knows this. I've shared with one friend. 
my family doesn't know, my team doesn't know. Everyone is like, oh, you're back, right? You sound good, you're back. No, guys, it's a healing journey when you crash, when you're so ill, including some of you, it takes time. Just because you sound good doesn't mean you're, you're ready to go back, you know, 100%. It's a long journey. So my first instinct was, okay, I need to get this checked. It's been there now for a while. But guess what? Two things can happen. Either they say there's none, it's not, or it's not a problem. Or they say, well, we have to take you know, a, a, a test. And then what is if they tell me, yes, you have breast cancer? which we see incredibly, if you research it, the cancer rates are going up dramatically after, but not because they're putting something in there, but your nervous system, your cells, everything is in chaos. And if I was so ill for three years with a total crash for the last seven, I knew I would be at risk, to be very honest. That's why I've been taking so much turmeric since August. I knew I was at risk, all right? So I said, what is if they tell me, yeah, you have breast cancer, what would I do with that information? First of all, it would increase the fear, I said. And I, it took me a week or two weeks, kind of put my head around this. Um, and then I said, well, they offer surgery or, maybe not in Rwanda, outside chemotherapy and radiology. That's your answer for cancer, am I right? Surgery or chemotherapy, it can be, you know, through various ways or radiology. Am I correct for you? For those of you who, who have? So here's the thing. My body is too weak to handle any of that. That's it. And that was my bottom, bottom line. I cannot even handle it. You know, I'm handling you guys now. I'm probably gonna have a bit of a relapse tomorrow, but that's fine, you know? I probably need to recover from that for two days from that chat we are having. But I'm much stronger, but that's, I cannot handle an operation, let alone chemo or radiology. And I just said to myself, the body is self-healing. I am, and I have all the power within me. I healed from 56 symptoms. Yes, my body probably is still trying to catch up with all the chaos. It may be very normal that I or many of you have cancer cells in their body. That's not a death sentence by any means. And it's just a normal kind of thing. And you kind of just have to re- re-engineer how you got here and that's what I've been doing as you can see I'm doing every single day with a lot of um a lot of uh, discipline um so here um so I decided against it I said I don't want to know because yes if they say yes uh, you have nothing of course that would be a release but if they say yes we found something it would just interfere with my story of health and the path I'm on because I'm doing so much better. So what have I been doing um, to, to um, just make sure this is taken care of? Three things, a lot of turmeric since August, the red light is helping with inflammation, cell regeneration and anti-cancer and meditation, becoming the person that is healthy. And when you are seeing yourself in that story, your mind, your body, your spirit, everything is primed for health. Then whatever you suffer from right now, listen to this, please. Whatever you suffer from right now is the old story. These are the leftovers of your old story. All right. So if you create a new story, your body will heal. Um, 
Um, so I, again, I'm sharing my opinion, my story, my perception of life. And I know that, you know, some of you, or you have maybe friends or family members, and, um, you know, th there may be different experiences you had, or different reasoning why you took certain um, decisions. But I want to just give an alternative um, and, and say, you know, maybe there is another way. And I, I don't have an option right now. My body is too weak to do any of that. Of that. Um, it would kill me, frankly. So what do I do? I use my body as my compass. How do I feel today? I'm making improvements. And my team has seen me a month ago. I, the, the fact that I can even speak to you, it's an improvement. My body is going to the right direction. I'm following that compass. Everything else doesn't concern me. My friend said, uh, please go to the doctor. I have your blood checked. Just see where you're at. I said, I'm not interested in the results of the laboratory. All I'm interested in, am I getting better? That's what I want to focus on. Everything else takes energy uh, off me and upsets my nervous system and my self-discipline. Um, so I'll, I'll be quick. I've been following YouTubers. Um, young YouTubers dying of cancer because suddenly it became my story, not it became my story, it became a concern for me during those two weeks. So I did a lot of research, rephrase that. Um, only during these two, two weeks until I made the decision and then I let go. Part of the letting go was also not to touch, to check, all right? Um, so look, uh, influencers, look, they died of cancer. Now what I'm thinking is like, my God, she's so ill. She's already dying. And all this machinery and the stress and the lights and the noises and the doctors coming in and all these um, toxins in her body, you're taking also the body's ability to, to heal or to recover. Kenya's third biggest kill killer is cancer. So we're not just talking about me and you and our family members. As we know, we're talking about entire nations where we are dying collectively. And look, look how young these cancer patients are. When many of us were young, who are now in our 40s, 50s, 60s or older, we were young, we hardly ever heard of cancer. Old people had cancer. Now people in their 20s have cancer. Where's all that coming from? Look at that Rwandan singer. He died. Uh, uh, last year, also of cancer, pancreatic cancer. Look at these people. Look how young they are. They're in their 20s. Why are they all dying of cancer? And here's now a timely message for you parents. And if this goes on too long for you, please, by no means, um, you know, call a break and, and, um, and, and you may go, of course, anytime. Um, but this is a very important message. Why are our young people in their 20s dying of cancer left, right, and center? And for me, for me, because we did not have that 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, for me, it comes down to one thing, the nervous system. Because our young people are constantly on their electronics, TV, phone, music, podcast. I mean, you name it, it's nonstop. Then they're at school, they, they, then they go to tutoring. It never stops. It never stops. Our young people are among such a pressure. And then all these, you know, these, these lights and medication and all these things that I showed you that are a stressor for the nervous system. And since our nervous system is connecting to all our organs, it's the engine of our body. It then also gives messages to our brain, our spinal cord, our gut, the microbes in our gut, and then also the chemicals we produce in the body and then to our cells. 
and the whole system collapses because our nervous system doesn't rest. And here is my plea to you parents, all of you who are parents. Our kids and our young people are under enormous stress. This generation is among, under more stress than anyone else, any of us have ever been. And that causes, is, as I said, the electronics, the, the, the lights, the fast paced kind of life everyone is living. But on top of that, also the pressure, the social pressure they're having now, the, the, the negative thoughts that go with that, all of that causes depression like we've never seen in young people, suicide like we've never seen, anxiety like we've never seen, illnesses and cancer like we've never seen. And we as parents, because we do not know better and many of us do not understand even the new generation. I didn't know about Generation Z until last year because <laughs> I sat my kids down. I didn't know what they're going through. Now I know. And we as parents, because we do not know better, and we have learned the parenting from our old generation, especially as African parents, we are putting even more pressure on them. We're putting more pressure on them, especially with their educational performance, right? We want them to be A students, and we put a lot of pressure, have you done your homework? And if that's not enough, we put tutoring on top of that. So after school, they have after school lesson and then they have Saturday tutoring and it just does not stop from morning to evening to late to weekends. And I know we know best. And again, this is my opinion. I just wanna steer maybe your soul and I wanna put out a new perspective. And then when they haven't done their homework, or they bring back a bad note. Sometimes we punish them. And I, I speak as we, all right? Doesn't mean that is, that is my approach, but I speak as we because we all have different parenting skill, uh, parenting uh, approaches. And then we want them to perform. We want them to become musicians and then we want to become them poets and athletes and ballet dancers and, uh, and you name it. And then when we are tired, because we are also equally leading a stressful life, we put them in front of electronics so we can have a quiet time. This is making our kids sick. We are priming our children to become the next generation of sick patients caught up in a medical system that is not equipped to deal with these kind of um, systematic system collapses in our children. More medication for our kids. Our society is killing our kids and our young. young. And we as parents, we need to change our approach. There's enough peer pressure. There's enough pressure from school. There's enough pressure from, uh, on your nervous system from electronics. We need to let go. Our family needs to, our family and home, this is my view. I'm just putting a different perspective out here. You can take from it whatever you want. Our families, our home need to be foremost a place of haven, a haven, security, safety, rest, relaxation, recovery, safety, fun, joy, sleep, play. And when our children are coming home and we are unloading our own ambitions or what we have missed out in life, or we are using our African parenting skills, sorry, I'm generalizing here with our strict rules and our punishments and whatever, we are making our kids sick. Where are they relaxing? Where, are, where is their time to relax, to just be, to ju just let, their soul be and be who they are, it doesn't matter if they have an A in chemistry or if they have a, 
a, a, a C in math. It doesn't matter, guys. You know why? Because our world is changing. It's changing very fast. That is, I'm going to touch on that on our next session on March 5. Most of us have even no clue how it is changing. No one needs a good mark anymore. No one cares. That's not what's going to prepare you for the new world, dear parents. An A in chemistry or math is not going to prepare you for the new world. What is going to prepare your children for the new world? Is to know how to deal with their emotions, how to combat challenges, how to combat their own fears and anxiety, how to combat pressure, how to relax, how to rest, how to get a good sleep, how to play, how to let go of addictive habits such as electronics or social media. Teach them about self-healing at home. Who cares what they had in, 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 in biology and, you know, it, seriously. Our world is changing, guys. And our kids are not prepared. They're vulnerable. They're so vulnerable. They're so vulnerable. So it just saddens me. I have, yeah, I, I see it around everywhere. The punishment of parents, or you know, a kid has been in school for the whole day, and now you have a test tomorrow, just work, you know, and then Saturday there's tutoring. It's making our children sick. And we have to stop it. Sorry, now I'm going kind of straightforward. We, the parent, are the only place, our home is the only place where they can heal and recover and be and find strength. And we have to make sure that our families and our homes become that place. Or we are sending children out there and teenagers and young adults, as we just saw, that will be the next generation of mentally sick people, physically sick people, and people who are unable to cope. So, remember this slide, excess death, why are they up? Why black women face triple threat from breast cancer? Uh, breast cancer journey, inflammatory doctor C growth and young, young women breast cancer. Thousands of young, young women are diagnosed with breast cancer. You, this is just one small section. I took out breast cancer of young women and they say young women in their 20s and 30s. But look further. Why are athletes collapsing? What explains these deaths? All right. Decoding heart attacks in young people. Why are people who are going to the gym who are considered to be healthy suddenly collapsing from heart attacks? Why do super fit young athletes suddenly suffer cardiac uh, arrest? Okay, this is all within the last few months, except for the uh, for one. Okay, so what we are seeing is not just cancer. We are seeing cardiac arrests among young people. People suddenly having a heart attack in their 20s even when considered healthy. Um, here it goes, um, it goes further, all right? Uh, people who are working out, we always were told working out is healthy. And the reason being, and this is why, uh, and the V word also linked to heart issue, cardiac, uh, cardiac uh, arrest in young people. And the reason, uh, the Africa Business Jump status, why we are seeing that even people who are athletes and healthy and exercising, Going back to what I said, our nervous system is already in overdrive, be it through the stress for life or now for a lot of people because of that. It is fighting um, that. And therefore, right now, if you have received this one or your kids, if you're working out as an athlete or something like that, right, it's dangerous because your nervous system is already in overdrive. You have to a little bit take your, uh, my older son, for example, is going to the gym here in Kigali. And I told him, 
you, you know, two or three times a week for an hour, that's it. Because my older child has received this one and the younger one, when I knew this was in London, I said, do not get it. My opinion, do not get it. So I, I'm not a, a conspiracy theorist. I'm not an anti pro. I went for it, my kid, I went down with it. Now the youngest kid do not get it. But again, this is, I'm just sharing my opinion. Please, my story really, you take from it what you, what you want, okay? So now we have athletes collapsing because the workout itself is also too much for the nervous system. And if it's already under stress from a stressful life that you are having or that one, then it can cause you to collapse or get heart attack, okay? Because um, the, the nervous system cannot deal with it any longer. Um, okay, so we're coming to an end. We're coming to an end. Um, but I think this is so important. We're saving lives with that awareness. Okay, so, uh, very quickly, our wake up call, very quickly, this is uh, Dr. Brzezinski. I would be very interested to know who knows him. He has found a cure for cancer in the 70s. I watched the video. If you want to watch something over the weekend, please, please, I beg you, make a note. Watch Suppressing a Cure for More Than 40 Years, um, Dr. Brzezinski, uh, The Cancer Cure Cover-Up, okay? Look, this is last month, it has been a month ago um, published, 3.2 million views. Please watch this video over the weekend, all right? He has found a cancer cure in the 70s. They tried to take him to court, the FDA, all right? Since the 70s, seven court cases, they tried to give him 250 years in prison the Cancer Research Association, you name them, the industry of pharma and cancer research and all of his patients, because he found a cancer cure that is far more inexpensive um, than chemotherapy and um, radiology. And above all, it has no side effects, but they did not want to give him the pat patent for that, all right? It is um, a wake up call, please watch it. And the reason why I want you to watch it is because we have put too much trust in our entire medical system, including doctors who are also becoming more and more fed up with the system. So I'm not putting doctors on the, on the uh, here, um, naming them at all. It's the system. And what we have to learn, and I learned it now, I kind of didn't know, how corrupt it is. Look, um, these are all his patients saying he cured us. And they came up to his court cases, um, tried to take him to court, court for over 30 years, 250 years in prison, right? They wanted to take him out. And there are many other names. Uh, you know, um, I think Dr. Sabi, and a lot of you know. Um, so this is really happening for a lot of people. Um, and Japanese doctors said, they tested it, it's viable. He can cure 70 to 80% of cancers. He says not all of them, 70, 80% of cancers he can cure and he does it individualized and everything is explained in the film how he does it, right? And the Japanese doctors tested it and they said it is true. And you know why they didn't, didn't um, patent it? Because he, they said the pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical um, industry in the US is not just powerful in the US, it is so powerful globally that, um, that they would finish us, okay? Those are the Japanese doctors. Um, so in the meanwhile, American Cancer Society, uh, you know, and we're going for a run for Cancer UK, Cancer uh, Society UK, when we have lost someone to cancer. And again, um, I'm not downgrading that. That's the normal thing to do. What I want to say is I have gained some new awareness because of my own challenge now, um, uh, especially finding that lump um, uh, for me. And 
I wanted to know more. Also in regards to, am I doing the right decision, making the right decision? And I'm sharing just uh, uh, some of that, um, those insights. So American Cancer Society, look, they have been around since 1930, 13, all right? Over 100 years. Do you really think in 100 plus years, no cancer cure could be found? I mean, ask yourself that question. Did you know the research started over a hundred years ago? And they're always putting this news or oh, new cancer cure found and then suddenly it vanishes and nothing is ever found. How did chemotherapy start? It started in 1919 and was then commercially used since 1947. Chemotherapy, dear Africa business jump starters, was started from a chemical weapon, a chemical nerve gas the Germans used um, in the First World War, not the Second World War, the First World War. It killed 10,000s of people. And that mustard gas, it's called mustard gas, that deadly gas was then the gas that resulted in chemotherapy and it's still being used today, all right? Of course, in small quantities, but I'm talking about the toxic toxicity of it, all right? Mustard gas, look, Cancer Research UK. Mustard gas from the Great War to frontline chemotherapy. I mean, this is cancer research. I mean, how crazy is even that headline? Mustard gas from the Great War to frontline chemotherapy. Have you been aware of that? I'm just asking because I wasn't. And the more I researched, the more was I convinced that my decision was right. I'm not going down that path. Yes, I know chemotherapy and radiology is saving a lot of people who do not know differently how to, to heal themselves. Let's say that, who do not know differently how to see it themselves. It has saved a lot of lives. But I believe from the research I did, and I did it over two weeks, that it has also killed a lot of people. Because a lot of people then die within the, within the five years after chemotherapy because the body is too weak. And if you look at the pictures from from uh, uh, Steve Jobs after his chemotherapy or Patrick Swayze, the actor, after his chemotherapy, just weeks after there are a few pictures, it's crazy. It's like, it looks like a healthy person going into chemotherapy and then a dead person coming out of it. So what I'm trying to say is we need to have another narrative and not be trapped into, um, into just believing that the pharmaceutical industry can save us. And who is funding um, those health associations and the government health departments? Guess what? Who is funding American Cancer Association? Look at the names. Look at the names here. And what about Novartis? Novartis is the number three biggest pharmaceutical industry for cancer pills, cancer pills, and, and, and so on. So don't you think there's a conflict of interest? And it's not just the American Cancer Society. It's all of them, including our government health departments. I've done the research. Our government health departments who are there to guide, to give us health guidelines are funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Don't you think there is a conflict of interest of what to say and what not to say? Coca-Cola, look at Coca-Cola. Here, look at what I put in, 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 in yellow. Coca-Cola in the last five years, uh, around that time, has spent 118 million US dollar on the America, uh, uh, on uh, health organizations, including the American Diabetic Association, look at it, Croatian Diabetic Association, the French Diabetic Association. So Coca-Cola is one of the main funders 
of diabetic associations across the world. And these diabetes associations are leading us in their research to find a cure for diabetes. And they're the ones who are putting out the guidelines, the guidelines, the national guidelines for our health. I mean, how crazy is that? How crazy is that? They're not driven, they're not driven, driven by healing people. It is conflict of interest. It is a corrupt system. That's what I came to realize. Hugely corrupt system. And, and guess who made, guess who made 50 billion US dollars, 50 billion. 50 billion, that's like four times the G GDP of a country like Rwanda. BioNTech, the organization that funded this one. And when, they, when did they give, give, give go live, uh, uh, like uh, uh, public? They go, went public four months before we all knew, four months. Guys, sorry, I didn't want to go into that. I, want to, I wanted it to be a raw session, but I think this is part of what we have to understand. I didn't know. That's why I got this. I did not know. I'm a scientist, okay? I got my PhD in natural scientist. I follow the data. I follow the evidence. I am not a conspiracist. I looked at the data of the national system. I looked at the website of those companies. And that's what I found. Yeah. Leading the evidence where, you know, following the evidence wherever it leads. All right. So I think this needs to be an eye opener, guys, because we are falling victims to this. And, and this is why it's important. We are, we are leaders of our communities, of our families of our businesses, but how are we going to, to lead if we're half of us are sick? And then we end up in a system, sorry to say, I'm not talking about individual doctors. Again, you know, they have saved my son's life. What I'm talking is a corrupt system and we do not know, most of us do not know. The FDA, UK, uh, Department of Health, you name them. Across the Western world, 70 to 90%, they're funded by industry, by big pharma. How crazy is that? They're not funded by our taxpaying money. They're funded by big pharma. And that's why you don't hear about the excess death in the, in the, in the, in the news. That's why you don't hear about healing your nervous system. Because no money is made from that. And that's why everyone keeps quiet. It's time to wake up. This world is shifting fast. I'm telling you guys, there will be a lot of losers in the next five to 10 years. Many of us are already feeling it, all right? There will be a lot of losers starting in the West, health-wise, economically-wise, and so on. And unless we wake up and we find a better way, I'm not saying battle the system. You know, most of us are not, this is not, what I'm saying is know your own powers. Don't give up your freedom and your powers. And one of your biggest freedom and powers is the freedom and the power and your ability to self-heal. Yeah, very corrupt world. All right. Um, all right, so just, just here for, for those of you, yeah. So if you're looking at the oncology, look, this is worldwide sales of pres prescription on over-the-counter drugs in billion US dollars. Look at that. 
Oncology is cancer, cancer treatment. 176 billion US dollars? I mean, I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, now you know. Now you know, seriously. Anyway, uh, yeah, and I was saying, um, and the, the one that, that made 50 billion US dollar from here, uh, yeah, they, they made 50 billion US dollar. They made 50 billion US dollar, 50 billion just from that rollout. Um, and in the meanwhile, we are counting excess death. No one talks about that one in the media and we're all getting sick. And the doctors are, doctors are raising alarm, doctors. If you look at YouTube, more and more doctors are coming out raising alarm. We're seeing a huge increase of cancer and cardiovascular disease in the last year and year and a half. All right, so no cure. Experts are still searching for a long COVID cure two years later. Really? They're saying still, we don't really have a cure. No, of course not, because you cannot heal the nervous system with a pill. Hence, they are telling you there's no cure for your illness. We're still doing research. Excess death across 30 countries are not mentioned across media because one, no one wants to admit the effects of the, and two, there's no pill to heal your nervous system. It is hence much more profitable to make money of your multiple symptoms, your diabetes, your thyroid issues, your depression, your cancer, you are profitable. So in closing, do we want a world like this for our children, our families, our community, the metaverse, or do we want this for our kids? It's time guys to go back from this to this. I understand the peer pressure. I understand how convenient it is. Kids are quiet. And we want to be up from there, right? We want to be, we want to know, we want to be update with, up to date with technology, especially the young ones. But that makes us sick and this one heals us, all right? What about things like that we did in the past, playing board games or let kids just be bored? Do we want this that is healing or do we want that world? That is the question. All right, and we have choices. All of us have choices. And I think we should carve ourselves out some niches. Africa also has the potential to carve, uh, for you to carve out that niche, you know? Um, so for our future, the Africa Business Jump Status, what we need is we need to leave alone everything that doesn't count, all right? And focus on health and spirituality. We need it. We need it to be strong enough to overcome what is coming because the next pandemic is coming. They're already talking about it, all right? In the World Economic Forum, in the world, I've, I've checked it. I've heard it from the, their mouth. One said, the next global pandemic could come as soon as tomorrow. That's exactly in the words, all right? World Economic, Economic Forum in Davos and also the the One World Government Forum that uh, summit, One World Government Summit. No, one, uh, one government, no, World Government Summit, sorry, World Government Summit in Dubai, all right? They're saying it's coming. Business income is important because you need to differentiate your income and diversify community because we need to, we need to help uh, each other and come together as a community and support each other, all right? And um, so in closing, becoming the person who is healthy, all right? Write this down. Um, this is a bit advanced, but this is what I'm doing now. I am the person who is healthy. I'm rewiring my brain, all right? Metacognition means that you become self-observant of your thoughts, your negative thoughts, your negative emotions, your negative habits. That is the step one. Write that down, metacognition, observing yourself. And that is very, very important. The first step towards changing who you become. You then, when you're aware of it, can change that through neuroplasticity and epigenetics. Your, your brain wiring can change your genetics, what is being um, 
um, lit up and what is being closed down can change as well, all right? And you have to create a new story for yourself away from self-sabotage because we're constantly self-sabotaging ourselves with our health, our happiness, um, be it in health, wealth, or love. And that is really, that is really my story. And I think I want to see, say a few closing words. Um, first of all, let me quickly check with you. Um, I just want to say a few closing words. Have you learned something new or have you received a new aspect? the self, power of self-healing, our children, our kids, how much they're under pressure and how we have to be the ones who release the pressure from them. And also how corrupt the system is and that we need to become our own masters in many areas. All right. Um, so, so I want to say a few a few closing words. Um, all of us are going through a human experience. And that human experience is not always easy. We all have our challenges. If you're suffering right now, know that you're not alone. All other humans, to one degree than another, are also suffering or challenge or being challenged or they have been suffering and had to overcome that and they have learned from it. So that is number one, it's a given. The big areas in which we all suffer are our health and well-being, mental health included, our, our love life. We all want to feel love. We want to be loved and feel loved um towards you know of course children family friends but also rom rom romantic love right we all deep down crave that and number three um of course is our financial status um a lot of us have problems money problems we feel overwhelmed with work and so on and with that also comes our freedom how much freedom do we have so i think one thing is important to say, we all experience it to one degree or another. But what is equally important is to understand that I believe, I believe that one role for us as human beings is to overcome these challenges in a way that we find ourselves. We become stronger within ourselves. We become more enlightened. We become, we become happier human beings. We are freeing ourselves. We're freeing ourselves from the opinions of others. We're freeing ourselves from um, the expectations. We're freeing ourselves from, from the system problem. And the world, how it is going, the Africa Business Jump Status, it is going to become much more challenging in all aspects of life. And again, I have done my research. Um, I will share a little bit that, of that on, 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 on March 5, how our businesses also need to change. But our business are also only a tool. What about us? What about us? How strong are we mentally, physically, spiritually, in terms of our finance? How strong are we to withstand the storms of our time? And these storms will come, become much heavier, I'm telling you. Therefore, and please hear me out, this is so crucial, I wanna get this message home. Therefore, the question now is, we are living in extraordinary times with a lot of risk and a lot of opportunity. A lot of challenges will come our way. Challenges that none of us have experienced in our generation, hands down. So 
So the question is, are we strong enough mentally, physically, financially, and with our relationships, our community, are we strong enough? What are we spending our energy and our time on is my question for you. In such extraordinary times, when so many people are struggling and so many people are going down, sorry, and going down literally, dying, ending up in poverty, people who have not, not been in poverty, ending up in poverty. We're just getting started. The Western world is just getting started, guys. So the question then is how prepared are we? How ready are we? How strong are we? Are we spending our energy and time on the right things? Is it really then the right time and energy spent to watch Netflix after Netflix after Netflix movie? Or is our time and energy better spent to learn about self-healing and start the self-healing progress? Or to strengthen our family and kids? Or to find a now, now another income stream to diverse our income so that we can be ready? How worth it is it to spend our time and energy on excessive negative thoughts? Many of us are, are guilty. And often when the nervous system is already in overdrive, we can't stop those thoughts. Very difficult to stop them. It's an addiction. Because even within our body, we're creating certain emotions and chemicals. Our body is addicted to negative news and negative emotions and negative thoughts. Part of our depression and our emotional um, um, meltdowns and even our, our talks to friends about, uh, you know, people who have done us wrong and how it changed and all of that. We have to be honest with ourselves. And I had to be honest with myself. It's an addiction. We already, our body is already making the chemicals. We are addicted to that. Just as we are to Netflix or food or drugs or medication or social media, you name it. We are a collective society of addicted people, most of us. And that leaves us vulnerable. It does not put us in a position of strength to be ready for what the world and the new world are, order are going to bring down the line. And that is worrying. And therefore, um, here are my, what I would say you need to do as your first steps. Very important. Take notes, I'm sure you have. Watch the video again if you have to, if you miss things or you need reminders. Maybe you find yourself one month down and you say, oh, I was so inspired. I was so during that, you know, or I thought, and now I'm kind of back in my old rut. Watch it again. Remind yourself. So here's what I believe you should do. Number one, take a couple of hours or a day out on a weekend and raise awareness, somewhere quiet, raise awareness for yourself. Where am I? What sucks in my life? Where are the negative pattern? Negative money pattern, call them out. Negative relationship patterns, call them out. Negative health patterns, call them out. Negative addiction patterns, call them out. Call them out, put them on paper. That's number one. Be honest with yourself. Number two, don't go into, into overwhelm trying to say, okay, I can't fix all of that. I think the most important stats, and this is the last gem I will give you today. It starts with you. What do I mean with that? Stop pointing the finger to anyone else. Yes, it may be those industries. It doesn't matter. You are not getting ready by following conspiracy theory 
after conspiracy theory, even if they are facts. Don't get caught up in that rabbit hole. Get your information if you need some and you move on with you. Don't get sidetracked with that, right? What about, what about, um, sorry, now I lost my, I, I lost my thread. Yeah, it starts with you, stop pointing fingers. So stop pointing fingers to the government. Stop pointing fingers at the, we already know, government, it doesn't matter even who is in government. Yeah, some are better than the others. Absolutely, hands down. I, you know, I was a political activist, so I know politics. But that's not the question. Right now, you cannot change it unless maybe you're going to have a, a, a vote in an election. Right now, you cannot change it unless you are, of course, maybe you are active, uh, you know, at community level in a political way. Absolutely. But if you're not, if you're not, stop discussing and arguing about it for hours. Unless you are a real uh, a change maker in that area, maybe you're an activist, maybe you're a politician, maybe you work for your local community, that's different. If you're just an observer right now, take, take care of yourself, that's what I would say. That's my, that's, my, that's my opinion. Doesn't mean you should not do anything, but I'm talking about the relation. Are you addicted to it or are you really making change? That's the question. Are you just talking because you want other people to read your comments or are you bringing real change in that area? If you bring real change in your political area, very good. So then the other question is, how much time do you spend, um, again, pointing the fingers on others, people who own your money, people you, who owe you, people who have done you wrong, uh, people you need to micromanage. What about, um, what about um, you being a perfectionist or a control freak? That's me too. Let go of all of that. You know what? It doesn't matter. Someone owes you a thousand dollars. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let go. Someone owes you. I had people owing me thirty-five thousand dollars. Let go. Let go. Doesn't matter. What matters is your health and you getting ready instead of doing court cases and being overwhelmed with I don't know being right. It's something that where someone did you wrong, let go of it. You're spending your money, money, your energy, your time, you're making yourself sick. And in the meanwhile, you become more weakened because you're not prepared. Let go of the old stories. Let go of people who did you wrong, forgive them, they did no better. Move on. You've been sick for 20 years, doesn't matter. That's the old story. Create a new one. Someone betrayed you. I'm sure there's a lot of men among you also who feel betrayed. Let me talk about, let me talk to my sisters. Do we have it difficult as women in this man-led world? 100%. We're living in societies that are led by men everywhere. And that is difficult in our femininity and the things that are important to us because society is ruled out in a way that is operational for men. It's not for it. That's, that's what I observed for the first time in my life. So that includes the workplace. It includes our family. In very many instances, men have the upper hand. And many of us have suffered abuse and betrayal. Let go of it. Release that trauma. Don't pass it on to your children. Don't hold it inside. It will make you ill. You may think you have forgotten, but it may still be in you. So 
start with metacognition, recognizing everything you think, you do, emotions, and see where you're pointing the finger to your boss, to your partner, to your house helps, to your employees, to you, to the weather, to the government, to the pharmaceutical, you name it, to the doctors who have not, don't point the finger, start with yourself. And that means work on your own strengths. And that puts you back in control. Prepare yourself and strengthen yourself. That's what I want to say, okay? So, um, and, um, and yeah, if you have, if you have uh, illnesses, uh, again, I have made a, a big list of what the nervous system wants. Focus on the nervous system. Resting is important. Just rest, take it slowly. Don't be the perfectionist. It doesn't matter. And I'm telling you as someone who has faced her own mortality just a few months ago, and even back in January with my myocarditis. It doesn't matter. Everything that we think does matter and we're getting stressed up over it, it doesn't matter in the grander picture of things. Let go of it. Focus on the things that do matter. Your health, your diversifying of your income so you're ready for what's coming. And, um, and what was the third one? Um, spirituality, I think I said. Spirituality, so you're, you're ready for it. Okay? So, the Africa is in Shanghai. I didn't look at the time. I stopped looking at the time because the old version of me always checked the time. Right now, I have no idea how long I spoke and how long you have listened and taken notes and how long we have interacted. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we had a chat and we came together as a community to support each other. And what matters is whatever you found, apply it. Make changes in your families and your communities. Share the information you learned. That's what matters. All right. Um, again, for all the medical doctors and experts, I love you. You're of great need in our society. You save many lives. You have saved many lives and you doing an amazing service in our communities. What I spoke about is the big system in which we are all caught up. Medical doctors, nurses, and patients together. And that's it. Um, I won't take any question today because I already kept you too long. Um, and I wish you strength, health, energy, foresight, wisdom, patience. That's it. I'll be closing. And I hope to see you next weekend. It will be another um, very important session, March 4 and 5. Um, stay healthy. Start right now. I can see some bright lights in your room. Remember what I say, said about the impact of bright lights in the evening. Get those, get those, um, those bulbs I shared with you. Um, turn off the lights. Turn off the big screens, the noise. Isolate. Listen to your soul. Because the voice of your soul and your nervous system and your body is a gentle voice. And if you're too busy and too loud and too stressed, you won't hear it. Right. I don't know why I feel like I feel like I feel like I just want to continue the whole the whole night with you. All right. So um, yeah, become the person that is healthy and loved and financially wealthy, and start from that. Good night, everyone. Much love. See you next weekend. Bye-bye.